Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research, a production also of Israeli News Live. And no doubt we'll probably run this broadcast on both channels because it is Yom Kippur. It is the Day of Atonement and an incredible holiday in Israel uh, at the moment. And a very day, a very solemn day. In fact, already in Israel, Yom Kippur is probably ending at this time. In fact, it's already ended in Israel. Uh, but across the world, Yom Kippur continues on as we wait for the sun to set to end Yom Kippur. But I wanted to share with you the origins of Yom Kippur. Most people are going to think Leviticus chapter 16. And yes, Leviticus chapter 16 has a lot to do with Yom Kippur. No doubt about it. It's when Moses first speaks about how the holiday is to be uh, celebrated. It is a day of affliction, a day of afflicting one's soul, a day of repenting. In fact, the week before uh, we are supposed to spend this time, as they call it, the days of awe, where we reflect and we make things right with those that we have wronged. And then we also, when Yom Kippur comes around, this is the time for the Jewish people then to make things right with God himself. And I think it's a holiday that is good for both uh, Jews and believers alike, believers in Yeshua. So I think it's very important that we that we keep this holiday. But, you know, years ago, I did a message about Yom Kippur, and I spoke about uh, the significance for the two sacrificial goats that are to be offered during this time, one being set free as a scapegoat, the other as an actual offering, as a type of Yeshua. I even went into it about how that Joseph plays a part in this. Well, the Lord has revealed even more to me this particular Yom Kippur, and I want to take that time to share the significance of this holiday that has just been celebrated in Israel and being finished up with with the Jewish people around the world of course California being the last place it'll be celebrated today uh, or possibly Hawaii as we go back east and it starts over as a new day uh, Leviticus chapter 16 and he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the door of the tent of meeting and Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel Wow, that's an interesting one. I guarantee you that. You're going to find out more about Azazel. And Aaron shall present the goat upon which the lot fell for the Lord and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat, but, but, but the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be set alive before the Lord to make atonement for him excuse me, to make atonement over him, to send him away for Azazel into the wilderness. Now, King James words this a little bit different, but I want you to kind of get an idea of what Jewish, uh, some of the Jewish sages from hundreds and hundreds of years ago, some of the thoughts that they've had on this, but it definitely is a reflection of Christ himself. He played both goats in this case he was the sacrificial goat as well as the scapegoat we're going to find that out in the story of joseph in a few minutes if you go to the jewishencyclopedia.com www.jewishencyclopedia.com this particular little section here about azazel if you looked it up online google just azazel you could probably find it with no problem it says cast into the fire to be consumed for that's not where we're going to go but what's interesting that i wanted to share with you is that the Jewish sages were actually using the book of Enoch very frequently when looking at other biblical matters. Even though it was not part of the Tanakh at that time, it was according to the Qumran community, but we go back and we look at these rabbis from you know, the 10th century, 12th century, etc. They're still using the book of Enoch. And in this case here, uh, uh, it says here, Yud Zet, uh, page 18, excuse me, 1864, pages 196 to 204. The story of Azel is as the seducer of men and women was familiar also to the rabbis, as may be learned from uh, from Tana Dbr uh, Yishmael. The Azel goat was to atone for the wicked deeds of Uzzah and Azazel, the leaders of the rebellious host in the time of Enoch. Okay, also on Yoma, page uh, 60, or 67b, it says, and still better from the Midrash, Ab Abakir and uh, uh, Yalak, uh, regarding to Genesis 44, where Azazel is represented as a seducer of women, teaching them the art of beautifying the body by dye and paint, uh, compared to Chronicles, uh, Yeramayel tr uh, translates by uh, Gaster in the XXV13, according to Perk R. L. 
Uh, we'll kind of skip over all the names there, but that's also in the uh, another Jewish book there we have. The goat is offered to Azazel as a bride that he who is identical with Sam Samael, and that's another name for Satan, believe it or not, Samael, or Satan should not be his accusations prevent the atonement of the sins on that day. Now, you know, these bring up some names here, friends, that many of you may not even be familiar with. Samael. Samael is referred to as Satan in many of the apocryphal writings. Uh, and as well as we see Azazel, who is one of the angels that came down. In fact, Azazel was the very angel that taught the art of war. Uh, he taught the women in the painting of the eyes. Now, when you think of that, I want you to keep Egypt in mind. You know how we see the hieroglyphics? We see the painting of the eyes, the, the different strokes in there. Okay, and I'm not saying anything against makeup, women wear makeup, that's not what I'm talking about. There's a specific uh, way the Egyptians did this that was totally different uh, than what you see in modern times. But this is what Azazel was doing, especially the art of war. And of course, they began to war against one another, even the Nephilim. That was part of the idea was for them to kill themselves off. But as we continue on, let's look at the book of Enoch right here in, in uh, chapter 10, verse 8. The whole earth has been corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel to him ascribe all sin. Another reason why we have written in the Bible that the scapegoat was to be set free to go to Azazel. And the sins of Israel were to be, they were to place their hand, the high priest was to place his hands upon the goat. And as he placed his hands upon this goat, he would confess the sins of Israel upon this goat and send it out to Azazel. Because after all, the children of God, the children of Seth, were not sinners by nature. This was brought in by the fallen watchers. That's what happened. Now, here's what's very interesting, and I wanted to share this with you because there's a reason why I'm looking at this, and as I stated, you must think, you have to keep in your mind, when we think Azazel, and we think about what he taught, and when you think about Egypt, we see that painting of the eyes. Now, there is beliefs that the Nephilim were in this land before the Andalusian destruction, as we see right here. And by the way, for those that like to say, oh, that's just a... That's just another one of those images that have been tampered with. Well, this is from Getty's images right here. So it's not tampered with. It's an actual real uh, image here. Uh, from the Christian truther, Nate Brown, on January the 2nd this year, 2017, says some experts are claiming that the Egyptians did not build these boxes. And what this is, these are huge tombs. And they say there's no way the Egyptians had the technology to build this. It is believed, it says here, of course, this is the idea that says we're left on earth by aliens, well, not aliens, fallen angels, no doubt. Uh, interestingly enough, that actually makes more sense than the mainstream theory that the Egyptians built these tombs with copper in hand tools. Uh, the head of the Egyptian archaeology, when announcing the discovery to mainstream media, instead of flat out lying, stated that they don't know how the Egyptians created the tombs. The tombs are unique because of the angles and the skillfulness of the stone cutting is actually accurate to just a few microns. That's extremely accurate. Uh, there is, there's also been uh, scientists that have suggested that the, uh, that the Sphinx itself is pre-flood and has some very powerful evidence to back it up. I encourage you to try to look that up uh, on YouTube. Incredible video. Hard to find, so I don't know if I could find it and put it in the comments below for you, but I'll try to remember to do so. The point is, though, they found 20, I think it's 24 coffins. And they did not, as far as I know, they haven't opened them because I don't know nobody could move the stones to begin with. But some of them believe, well, this was where they kept the Abus bull was inside of the coffins. But there is a lot of speculation that giants were actually buried inside of these coffins. Now, I didn't do enough research to go further into this. I was just really looking for Egypt and there being a link with the Nephilim, because we know that Nof and Taphanes, it's written in the Bible about how they were feeding on the crown of the head or feeding on the human brain there, uh, not like eating it per se. I believe they were trying to affect the DNA of the true sons and daughters of God is what they were doing. But according to some of the Arabic writings, Nof is actually 
part of the Nephilim. So there is some interesting thoughts in there. But when we're looking at Yom Kippur, one of the most incredible things that I picked up many years ago, the Lord revealed to me that Joseph may have been one of the reasons why this holiday became a, re a reality for Moses uh, when he came to Leviticus 16 and spoke about this particular holiday. Let me, let me share with you why. Uh, we're actually going to look at uh, both Genesis and we're going to look a little bit at, at Jasher. And, and don't be afraid of the book of Jasher. Uh, it is clearly spoken of in our own Bible. I know that we don't know, we don't have an old enough version to say that the version that we have today is authentic or the, the changes. Therefore, I always, as I always say to people, you know, your Bible that you have now, that's your plumb line. But look at the resource tools. And later I'm going to share with you how some of the early church fathers as well utilized several different other books that are not part of the canon. And they were the ones that were putting the canon together. And they state they were using it for the purpose of further education and, and things of that nature. I'm going to share that with you soon because I found that recently. Uh, Genesis chapter 37, And they took him and cast him into the pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. This is, of course, we know the story of Joseph. He was a dreamer. I want to kind of backtrack for those of you that may be listening that know nothing about the story of Joseph. Joseph was gifted of God. He was uh, the, the 11th son of Jacob. Yaakov, uh, and of course he was the first son of Achel or Rachel, uh, and and of course you know she was barren for many many years, and so when Joseph came along, it, it happened during the time of Yaakov's uh, old age. He was very much loved, uh, and of course all the other brothers were realizing that that whether it be the brothers from the concubines or from Leah, they all knew that he was loved and very much favored. Uh, later, of course, Benjamin, the last son, is born. This is where we get the 12 tribes of Israel from, are from the sons of, uh, of Jacob. Later, of course, we know Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, come into play there. But in the case of Joseph, Joseph was majorly gifted. He see, seen dreams. Uh, he, was a, he was a man of vision. And the things that he saw, oddly enough, many of them have come to pass. Now, I say oddly enough because there is one vision that was never fulfilled in his lifetime. And a lot of people are unaware of that. And, of course, uh, I'm sure some people, like my good friend Rabbi Tobias Singer, uh, I'd love to speak with him about that because to me it would be fulfilled in Yeshua's life, not in Jacob's life itself. And that was where he saw that the, the, uh, the stars, the sun and the moon, which represented his father and his mother, they would all come and bow before him. Well, his mother died, so she never was one that actually bowed before her son. Uh, so there, that's a script, that's a prophecy that is yet to fulfill. But the brothers have, and his father came and bowed before him, but not his mother. Something to think about. Keep that in your mind. Uh, but anyway, because of his uncanny ability to see visions, and he would speak these to his brothers and his mother and father. His mother and father held it dear to their heart. They watched it very carefully, but his brothers hated him all the more. And of course, incredible type of Yeshua. You know, in fact, everything about the story of Joseph clearly identifies Yeshua to be the Mashiach and something I'm going to go into deeper later. I've done it before many years ago. I've got to go into it for my Jewish brothers and sisters, but I'll just give you a couple just off the top of the head. And then we're talking about where mainstream Christianity has recognized some of the incredible things like, you know, Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver, Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. We know those types there. But have you ever thought about why they found their money in their bag. Remember, they go down to Egypt and they, his brother finally reveals himself to him. But before he does, he puts their money back in the bag. And they discover their money the first time at the inn. Why at the inn? Why at the hotel? The Bemalon, we say in Hebrew. Uh, at the inn, he found his money back in his sack. That was a foreshadowing of the coming of Yeshua that he would also be rejected by his own people when his mother, when he was yet in the belly of his mother, and they, were, they found no room for him in the inn at the hotel. So it's, a, it's a, like a subliminal message, so to speak. And why did he put his cup in Joseph's bag of all things? Well, that's obvious too. Because they rejected Yeshua where? At the communion table. A lot of things there, beautiful things. I'll save it for another video because I want to stay on track here. So let's get on to it. They, and they took him and cast him into a pit. His brothers, they saw him coming. This is down in Dothan. Uh, and they're trying to figure out a way to get rid of him. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. 
And they sat down at the, to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites came from Gilead, and with their camels bearing spicery and balm and landonum, going to carry it down to Egypt. All right. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our flesh. And his brother hearkened unto him, and there passed by Midianites, merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for twenty shekels of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. Now, if you look at verse 26, Judah is a clear type of the house of Judah, all right? And he doesn't want the blood of his brother being on his hands. Neither did the house of Judah want the blood of Yeshua on their hands. And what do they do? They pass him off to the Romans, right? So, uh, but there's another thing that happens when we read here in Genesis about this. And I remember one brother, a very precious brother, he said to me one time, he said, well, you know, Steve, you always talk about that Joseph's brothers sold him out to the Ishmaelites. And he said, but technically the scripture never says they sold him at all. Because my point is, is that there must be restitution made for selling Joseph out. Something that they never did. And if you look at this particular reading right here, as it says here, and they passed by the Midianite merchants, and they drew and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites. So it appears, though, that even though the intent was there for the brothers of Joseph to sell him to the Ishmaelites, the Midianites do it instead, and they never have any hand in the actual selling of Yeshua. Well, this is where it comes in handy to have other documentation to refer to to clear up the matter. And that's what we find here in the book of Jasher, chapter 42. We're going to read quite a bit of this, but uh, just to kind of bring this story back to where it should be. It says, They went and sat on the opposite side about a distance of a bow shot, and they sat there to eat bread. And while there they were eating, they held counsel together the, uh, what was to be done with him, whether to slay him or bring him back to his father. Now, that's another major issue in itself right there, because if you remember, when we're looking in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 11, we find out the lawless of your people. The angel Gabriel tells Daniel, the lawless of your people, the sons of the lawless, they will try to marry the vision. Now, that's a totally different subject, but the point is, there's a council meeting going on on what to do with Joseph just like they did with Yeshua, and just like they're going to try to do with the two witnesses, right? They were holding the council when they lifted up their eyes and saw, and behold, there were, was a company of Ishmaelites coming at a, uh, at a distance by the road of Gilead going down to Egypt. Same thing in Genesis. And Judah said unto them, What gain is it for us to slay our brother peradventure? God will require him from us. This then is a counsel proposed concerning him, which you shall do unto him. Behold, this company of Ishmaelites go down to Egypt. Now therefore, come, let us dispose him to them, and let not our hands be upon him, and they will lead him along with them, and will be lost amongst the people of the land, and we will not put him to death with our own hands. And the proposal pleased his brethren, and they did according to the word of Judah. Now, this is incredible. If you've ever read the story of Joseph in Jasher, or if you haven't, you need to. Chapter 42, you can find a PDF online. Read the entire story. You would be amazed to see how repentant his brothers come later when the famine is coming on. And the reason why I say repented for what they did, and they wanted to make this right, they even went looking for him. It's the same thing Israel is doing today. Right now, they're trying to hold, they want to hold a trial to clear Yeshua of what they accused him of. My brother, sister, this is what they did 2,000, more, gosh, that's over 3,500 years ago with Joseph, his brethren, according to the book of Jasher, when his, their father sent him down there, they went looking for Joseph. They wanted to make it right. And the Jews today in Israel, they're wanting to make this right. 
Yana interviewed one of the, the brethren there. And I know some people got angry. They said, oh gosh, I can't believe some of the things he's saying. You know what? Forget what he's saying. The thing is, is look at his heart and what he's trying to do. That man was trying to clear Yeshua and wants to do a public trial to clear him of these deeds. They're following the same line as what the book of Jasher shows us. Let's go on with the book of Jasher. Verse 5, chapter 42, And while they were discoursing about this matter, and before the company of the Ishmaelites had come up to them, seven trading men of the Midian, of Midian passed by them. As they passed by, they were thirsty. They lifted up their eyes and saw the pit in which Joseph was Im uh, uh, immured, or immersed, and they looked, and behold, every species of bird was upon him. They were thinking there was water there, right? And these Midianites ran to the pit to drink water, for they thought that it had contained water. And coming before the pit, they heard the voice of Joseph crying and weeping in the pit. And they looked down in the pit, and they saw, and behold, there was a youth of comely appearance and well favored. And they called unto him and said, Who art thou? And brought thee hither and who placed thee in this pit in the wilderness and they also assisted to raise up joseph and they drew him out and brought him up from the pit and took him and went away on their journey and passed by his brothers hmm. and these said unto them why do you do this to take our servant from us this is joseph's brothers now saying what do, you, what do you think you're doing to take our brother i mean to take our servant they call him a servant they're not calling him a brother same thing with israel they didn't call him their brother Right? And go away. Surely we place this youth in the pit because he rebelled against us. And you come and bring up and lead him away. Now then give us back our servant. And the Midianites answered and said uh, unto the son of Jacob, sons of Jacob, is this your servant or does this man attend you? Peradventure you are all servants for he is more comely and well favored than any of you. And why do all speak falsely unto us? They seem to be of a better character. And all the sons of Jacob approached them and rose to them and said unto them, Give us back our servant. And why will you die by the edge of the sword? And the Midianites cried out against them. And they drew their swords and approached to fight with the sons of Jacob. And behold, Simon rose up from his seat against them and sprang upon the ground and drew his sword and approached the Midianites. And he gave a terrible shout before them and that, that his shouting was heard at a distance and the earth shook at Simon's shouting. The Midianites were terrified on the account of Simon and the noise of his shouting, and they fell upon their faces and were exceedingly alarmed. And Simon said unto them, Verily I am Simon, the son of Jacob the Hebrew, who have only with my brother destroyed the city of Shechem and the cities of the Amorites. And so all so shall God moreover do unto me, that if your brethren, the people of Midian, and also the kings of Canaan, were to come with you, they could not fight against me. We're talking about Nephilim now. Now therefore, give us back the youth when, whom you have taken, lest I give your flesh to the birds of the skies and the beasts of the earth. All right? Surely you have said that the young man is your servant and that he rebelled against you. Therefore, you placed him in the pit. This is the Midianites talking now. All right? What then will you do with a servant who rebels against his master? Therefore, sell him unto us. All right. And so they actually agreed to do so. Verse 18, And the Midianites saw that Joseph was of comely appearance, because they sold him right, for 20 pieces of silver and well favored. They desired him in their hearts and were urgent to purchase him from his brethren. And the sons of Jacob hearkened to the Midianites, and they sold their brother Joseph for 20 pieces of silver. And Reuben, their brother, was not with them. And the Midianites took Joseph and continued uh, their journey to Gilead. I don't know if you know this or not, but Reuben... He's the one brother that didn't want any evil happening to his brother Joseph. He was trying to convince them otherwise. Do you know his name in Hebrew means behold a son? So when he was crying out for his brother Joseph and for his brothers not to do any harm to him, every time they would say his name and speak against him, they kept saying behold a son, behold a son totally blind, totally oblivious to the sun that was in the pit. They were going along the road, the Midianites, and they repented of what they had done. They began to feel bad about buying Joseph. And in having purchased the young man, and one said to the other, what is this thing that we have done? 
and taking this youth from the Hebrews, who is of a comely appearance and well-favored. Perhaps this youth is stolen from, from the land of the Hebrews. And why then have we done this thing? And if he should be sought for, for and found in our hands, we shall die through him. And so what do they do? They sell him. Now, actually, let me, let me point something out to you here as well. The Midianites, notice how they do? They're repentive. They recognize he's a comely boy. Doesn't that remind you of the Roman centurion? Remember Matthew 27, verse 54, truly this was the Son of God. So many types and shadows laying in there. So while as they were thus discoursing together, they looked and behold the company of the Ishmaelites which was coming at first, which the sons of Jacob saw and was advancing toward the Midianites. And the Midianites said to each other, come let us sell this youth to the company of Ishmaelites who are coming towards us and we will take for him the little that we gave for him and we will be delivered from his evil. And they did so, and they reached the Ishmaelites, and Midianites sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, which they had given for him to his brethren. And the Midianites went to their road to Gilead, and the Ishmaelites took Joseph, and they led him a ride upon the camels, and they were leading him to Egypt. Very, very serious situation. Now, what are we looking at when we see the story of Joseph? Joseph is very much a type of the scapegoat. He is bearing the iniquity and the sins of all of his brothers. And if you look at the story in Leviticus when God gives Moses the command and he gives Aaron the command, lay your hands upon the scapegoat, confess the sins of Israel, and let him go into the wilderness to Azazel. Now isn't it odd that in this case, Joseph is being taken down to Egypt by the Ishmaelites, and it just so happens to be that there is archaeological evidence that supports that the Nephilim, before the flood, lived in Egypt. And if you look it up, there is a lot of evidence that suggests that. Now, I saw this clearly by revelation. And when I get revelation, when God reveals something to me, I begin to search to see, is there other Evidence that supports what God has revealed to me. And this is what the Lord had showed me. That Joseph was a type of the scapegoat that is taking the sins of his brothers far from their father's eyes. In this case, Jacob as a type of the Almighty. They're taking his sins far from their father's eyes. He bears it in his body. He suffers it in the flesh and takes their sins down to Egypt where Azazel once lived and we can see this in the very fact that the Egyptians were known to be a warring people they were painting the eyes everything that Azazel was teaching before the flood the Egyptians were still carrying the traits to this day and this is where Hitler goes to try to find out the technology that was used and later we find that Hitler goes down to where Antarctica he must have found out that this is where they're imprisoned what do you know interesting it gets more interesting than that though all right, let's go back to Genesis and look at the story again, though. And he returned unto his brethren and said, The child is not, and for, as for me, whither shall I go? And this is Reuben. He's returned back. And they took Joseph's coat. And by the way, I am skipping down several verses down in the story to save for time. And they took Joseph's coat and killed, as, uh, killed a he-goat and dipped the coat in blood. And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Now know whether it is thy son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without, is without doubt torn in pieces. There's several things that I want to share with you here, friends, that are so incredibly beautiful. One, this is the sacrificial lamb. This was the lamb that suffered without a cause. There was a scapegoat, that was Joseph. The sacrificial lamb was the lamb that was killed and was not guilty of anything, but he was killed to hide the sins of Joseph's brothers. And that little lamb took their place. And I believe that God accepted that temporarily 
just like in the case of today. You know, until 2,000 years ago when Yeshua came, all the sacrifices that are being offered, that was just a temporal thing. It did not put away sin. It did not stop the worshiper, as Paul even brings out, of having that desire of sin no more. Only Yeshua could do that. Separate message altogether. I'll get into that with you, my Jewish brothers, as well. All right? But in the case of Joseph, he was a scapegoat. He went to Azazel where he was at. And that because it was a and by the way, when you read in the Bible, we find out in Leviticus it was a barren land. Why? Because when the flood came, yes, it was a barren land. It's only a type and a shadow, okay? Now, in the case of Yeshua, though, he's both scapegoat and sacrificial goat in these in this case as well, in this story. All right. So let's take let's take a let's look into this a little bit deeper now. Now, uh Oh, by the way, too, I, I have to share this way. I made myself some notes here, so I keep glancing over there so I didn't forget all the things that the Lord began to share with me. If you look at verse 33, and we'll look at it again, and he knew it and said, it's my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without, without doubt torn in pieces. Do you realize that Jacob was prophesying of the coming of the Mashiach, the coming of the Messiah, indirectly? He had no idea, but a beast, Satan himself, would devour Christ and he would be torn in pieces, which he was when they beat him and he was beat beyond recognition by the beast system, as we read about in Revelation. All right? I believe it clearly was a prophecy. Dropping back over to Leviticus chapter 16. Then shall, the, then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with his blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the ark. See, the ark, upon the ark cover and before the ark cover. Lifne. Isn't it beautiful? It's just beautiful the way this is all worded right here. Um, Get your okay, the et demo, his blood, and okay, and sprinkle it. All right, and just real quick, the demo ka ashar ose la dam hapar, okay, ve ve haze oto al hakapirat, ve lifne, see, before, before the ark. And I bring that up because if you remember, those of you that know a little bit about Ron Wyatt. Uh, and I can't say it so 100% or not. I met Ron's, uh, his widow, uh, Mary Lou Wyant, wonderful lady. And um, one thing that no, I saw that Ron believed that he had found the Ark of the Covenant under Golgotha, where the cross was supposedly actually put. And he found through some kind of doing some kind of testing there that an earthquake had happened. Of course, we know an earthquake did happen. The, the mountain was split and he found what he believed to be blood and where he, inside of that mountain there, he found what he claimed to be the Ark of the Covenant. And he said the blood was on top of the Ark and also in front of it. Could that be? Could it have been that Yeshua, when he died on the cross, if that ark was there, could that truly have been what happened? Makes a lot of sense. And he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanliness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions, even all their sins. So shall he do for the tent of meeting that dwelleth with them in the midst of their uncleanliness. And there shall be no man in the tent of meeting when he goeth uh, when he goeth in to make atonement into the holy place until he come out and have made atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel. All right. Now, also here. And when he hath made an atone, uh, atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and their transgressions, even all their sins. And he shall put them upon the head of the goat and shall send them away by the hand appointed man in, into a wilderness. Keep that in mind as well. An appointed man. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land which is cut off or a land which is not inhabited. And he shall let go the goat in 
the wilderness. And as I said already, verse 22, notice that man appointed. Just like in the case of Joseph. There's two things here. The man that's appointed is a type of Judas. He is the one shall send him away by the hand of an appointed man into the wilderness. He was the appointed man, Judas was, that sold out Yeshua. In this case, it was the Ishmaelites that took Joseph down to that barren land that later became occupied after, after, uh, after the flood, but it became barren because of the flood. All right? And so also, I uh, want to share with you Matthew. What did he say here? When Pilate saw that he could prevail, nothing, but rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See you to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Now, Pilate kind of reminds me of the Midianites as well, as we saw they didn't want anything to do with the blood being upon him. But I think too, and I've shared this with you guys many years ago, those of you that have listened for a long time and know this, then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and our children. Most people think of this as a derogatory statement. But do you realize, had the blood of Christ not been applied and atoned, then their sins would not be forgiven. This is why they didn't die then. This is why the nation of Israel was not wiped out then. Like in the story of Joseph, Yeshua is just like Joseph. They sold him out. They had to do it. Because why? God knew that he had to save life with the life of Joseph. Because he knew there was a coming famine. And the only way to save his brother's lives was to go through what he did. And then they do. They survive. But then they also go through a bondage period of 400 years. More than 400 years. It's the same thing. Yeshua come. They had to sell him out. But His blood atoned for their sins. He became the sacrificial goat. And as well, He also became the scapegoat. Because why? He rose from the dead. And when He rose from the dead, He carried in His body the sins of Israel far away. And you still look for a Mashiach. You really look for a Messiah? You show me one Messiah, one candidate, my Jewish brother, sisters, that can type the story of Joseph in this day and age. Anywhere in the last 2,000 years, show me the candidate that has borne both sacrificial and scapegoat in their body. He'd have to be able to raise up again to carry your sins far away. He would have to die and bear in his body as the true Lamb of God. And what did they say? Behold, the Lamb of God, right? That take what it, that's what John said, right? Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Do you not know that John was telling you, Yom Kippur is here before you. God has delivered in your hands the two goats that are needed for your redemption. It's amazing. Going back to Leviticus, we're going to look at verse 33 in just a moment. For on this day shall the atonement be made for you to cleanse you from all your sins. Shall you be clean before the Lord? It is a Sabbath, a solemn rest unto you, and you shall afflict your souls. It is a statute forever. And the priest who shall be anointed and who shall be consecrated to the priest in his father's stead shall make the atonement and shall put on the linen garments, even the holy garments. And he shall make the atonement for the most holy place. And he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar. And he shall make atonement for the priest and for all the people of the assembly. 
And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make atonement for the children of Israel because of all their sins once in the year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. Why don't we offer up the sacrifices for Yom Kippur anymore for the last 2,000 years? Because the way has been made that both the, the fulfillment of Moses' law in Leviticus 16 was fulfilled when Yeshua come and died on the cross, raised up, and as a living sacrifice carried the sins of the children of Israel very far away. And also, the atonement was made for the holy place. What is that? That is your heart. He made atonement so that you could receive the Holy Spirit inside of you. You don't have to wait. Don't you remember when the Roman soldier took the spear and drove it into his side? Zechariah says that you will look upon him whom you have thrust through. Now you might say the hands and you might say the feet were pierced, but it's the thrust through, as Rabbi Tobia Singer often says, and it's the Roman soldier that thrust him through. But God holds Israel accountable because you sold him out to the Midianites and the Midianites to the Ishmaelites passing the buck, but nonetheless we still hold that in our bosom, alright? So therefore, his blood has atoned for you, and when that blood, when his side was pierced, both water and blood come from his side. And when that water and blood come from his side, it was a sign like the woman at the well when he says to her, if you knew who it was that asked me for a drink, I would tell you and you wouldn't have to, you wouldn't have to ask nobody, you wouldn't have to come to the well no more for a drink, would you? What is it? The rock that was in the wilderness journey. When God commanded to Moses to take with him the elders of Israel and go out and smite the rock, not the second time now 38 years later, but the first time when they'd only been gone for a couple of weeks and they were moaning and they were groaning, they were thirsting, and they said, you brought us out here to the wilderness to die. All right? And what did he do? He said, take the elders of Israel with you and go out and smite the rock that it bring forth waters. And that's exactly what Moses did. And when he did, the water come from the rock. And even though they were moaning and groaning and wanted to kill Moses, they drank the water. If they didn't drink the water, they would have died. And so Yeshua, when his side was pierced and that water separated from his blood, it showed that he truly was the rock. Even the Jews know it's Hatsur in Hebrew. Hatsur, the hay, the definite article before the word sur, the rock. And they know that the same rock that Moses smote there, that he was commanded to speak to, but in disobedience, he smote the rock the second time 38 years later, is the same rock even though it was a big distance apart. Christ was that rock. And even in the Hebrew language, we say that God was the one on the rock. The redemption's been paid. The Holy of Holies, your human heart, as Rabbi Orly says, the temple was laid out just like the human body. And he said the Holy of Holies was your heart. And that atonement was made so that that life, what was, when, when God had that rock smoke, the waters of life flowed from the rock. When Yeshua's side was, was pierced, what was it? He is the bridegroom. You are the bride. But in order for you to be able to mate and become one with your Creator, the Spirit of Almighty God had to come from that man's side. It had to be released back upon you so that you could be filled with the Spirit of Almighty God. And in order to be a true bride of Christ, you have to have the feminine and the masculine come together in unity together. And until that unity has happened, then there will be, there's no more way that you can be His. You can't be His bride without that happening. And unlike some teach that, oh, Yahweh is the husband to Israel and the, and the church is the, is the bride to Christ. That's like taking another man's wife. Do you realize that? That's false teaching. And that's why I'm back on the, back in the, back in the, back again, writing to tell you what the truth is. Because that's not true. It says clearly in the laws of Moses, a son cannot take his father's wife. You cannot have your father's wife. And if, if that be the bride of Christ, his, what did Paul say? I have espoused you a chaste virgin to Christ, to the Jewish people that he was witness to before he ever went to the Gentiles. How in the world then could they be a bride when they were Jews if Yahweh was their husband? 
God said it's a penalty of death to take your father's wife. Think about it. I'm Stephen Benoon. I trust this has been a blessing to you. Those of you that watch here on Israeli News Live, love the insights of news, I will bring you a news broadcast later tonight. I just had to share this here on Yom Kippur. I need Yom Kippur to end before I do news because it's a day of mourning for us. And my heart mourns for my people that they will recognize that Yeshua is the Mashiach. That's my mourning time. That is the reason why this day is so important. Stand with us, won't you? Support the work we're doing, please. Visit our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. Your help makes us possible.